Gomez. Walter makes a run ahead of it. Burkamp suddenly changed pace through the centre. It's Burkamp! That's magnificent! The move, and then this, which left Dabby's ass totally stranded. Hello, and welcome to a Burkham One Down, the Arsenal podcast. My name is Carl, and I am extremely happy. Why, you might ask, why am I happy? Because I don't have work tomorrow, or Friday, or Saturday, or Sunday. So, yeah, you can imagine I am extremely happy. Uh, to share in my happiness and to talk about all things Arsenal, uh, it is the lover of ladies and some men. Uh, it is uh, Josh. Not Josh. Sorry, I ruined it. I ruined it. Do you know what it is? Because Josh is in my eye line. Well, maybe Josh is the lover of some ladies and some men as well. So, uh, Josh, how are you? I feel like that was a Brighton joke taken far too far. How dare you? How dare you? Um <laughs> No, I'm all right, thank you. Um, I was going to be nice to you and say I thought you were striking next week um, to be off work for four consecutive days, but um, I guess not. No, that's National Rail. London Underground doesn't... Well, I don't strike. Some do, but if they must have my believe pension... You don't You're a scab, aren't you? That's what I've heard. A scab. I, I would never you. scab. But <laughs> if they mess up my pension, as they're talking about doing, I may have to go and strike. Now, if I strike, London Underground doesn't run a single train. So they better not mess up my pension because I'm nearly as old as Chris, which we'll talk, uh, talk about later. Nearly as old as him. So he'll be drawing his pension way, way, way before I do. Wow. So. Um, yeah, I don't have such problems. Um there's pensions. I think I'm just going to live in a hovel somewhere and uh, cry when I'm about 70 or something, whatever it is, when uh, young whippersnappers like me will be able to uh, do a pension. But anyway, um, have you got a introduction that you're going to do for me that you can introduce um, our next guest with? Okay. Um, <laughs> and the next guest here is the man who supports two teams uh he's a glory hunter but i don't think either team have won a trophy in a very long time so i don't know if you can call it glory uh it's john welsh john how are you uh, i'm very well that's the nicest intro i think anyone has ever done for me on the show that's <laughs> it, you know there is nothing about my personality or my reputation or anything else that's it's, it's quite nice being josh i like this <laughs> See, sometimes, but when you go out in the sun, uh, it's not nice being Josh. No, that's true. Yeah. No, uh, although cars. I am I am also very pale skinned. I'm not ginger, but I might as well be because uh, <laughs> me and the sun don't mix well. <laughs> See, you're all lacking on this wonderful thing called menelin. Yeah. Of, yeah. It's just one of those things, I guess. <laughs> um, but I tell you what, I'm happy for several reasons, John. And one of those reasons is the result on Sunday, which was Arsenal versus Manchester United. Um, we were just brilliant that day, wasn't we, John? Because for me, I mean, the lineup was never going to change, was it? So there's no point us going on the lineup. I think we kind of had the same lineup for <laughs> consecutive games. But going into that game, John, how did you feel? Was you nervous about playing that game? Did you think it was going to win? Was you confident we was going to win what was your mood um well i did have a little punt on the game uh before so i'm sure some people saw on twitter and i had uh arsenal to win and katia to score both teams to score uh was my bet which did come in obviously um i wasn't i, w I thought we could win the game but i'm not gonna lie i wasn't like super confident it's weird the spurs game the week before i went into it really relaxed normally spurs game um, especially away, I'm like, just because of the way the results have gone, the, you know, last five or six years, I think it has been at their place. Um, but that one, I was just like, no, nah, we, we, we're so much better than them. We'll blow them away, no problem. This game was a little bit different because it's like, you know, they're the only team that's, I know San Fabio obviously beats in a cup, but that was a very changed team. But they're the only team that's beaten us, really. Um, and even in that game, that was probably one of our better games of the season, but we still lost. They're in really good form. 
You know, Rashford was firing. They've solved all the problems with Ronaldo and everything else. They look like the defence is all sorted out. Um, obviously, they were missing Casemiro, but I thought, I mean, before I saw the lineup, I honestly, I thought Fred was going to play because he's been playing quite well this season. Then I felt a little bit more confident the moment I saw McTominay's name on the team sheet because I was like, ah, oh, this is fine. Because um, <clears throat> if anyone wants like really, really good in-depth analysis on the game, uh, go to TIFO IRL. Uh, probably loads of people follow him on Twitter. They've got a really good YouTube channel. There's a guy in there called JJ Ball who breaks down goals, analysis, corners, all sorts of things. And he does it really, really well. But it's not boring. It's like interesting. It makes it fun. Um, and he described McTominay in the best possible way I think I've ever seen, which is he's a box-to-box -box player who can't play football in between the boxes. Like he's good defending because he's massive and he's good attacking the ball because he's massive. But anything in between those two boxes, he can't do. So I felt a lot more confident when I saw his name on a team sheet. And yeah, that that game, to me, the result and the way we won it was just, ah, it was so good to enjoy. Obviously, there were nerves and stuff throughout the game because of the, the way the score line was changing back and forth. But when it got to that 2-2 point and we were really laying in the pressure, there wasn't like a doubt. I didn't have like a, oh, I'm not sure if we're going to do this, kind of like in the Newcastle game, I wasn't quite sure if we get the goal or not. Like in this one, I just felt like it was going to happen because we were laying so much pressure and we were so much better than them. So much better. And I don't think the scoreline is a real reflection of the game at all. Um, I would have loved to have been in the stadium. Everyone I spoke to who's been actually was at the game said like it was incredible. Like the atmosphere all season has been great and has been for a while now, but like in that game was just ridiculous. It was completely nuts. And just every single player was just really, really on it. There was a few, you know, ropey moments in the first half, but that second half in particular, we looked miles better than Man United. They couldn't get anywhere near us. You know, they just couldn't, could not get out of their half. And there was one team trying to win that game. They were not trying to win it. They were clinging on for a point. That's what they were hoping for. Um, so, yeah, I loved actually every minute of it. And all this week, I've been listening to every football podcast I can find. I've even listened to a few Man United ones where it's like angry Man United fans analysing it and stuff just to get in, like just soak it all in and enjoy it as much as I can because it is so good. And, um, yeah, the the all the boys on the pitch were incredible. Um, obviously, we'll talk about like individual players and stuff. The manager was great, fans were great, um, and it winds up Richard Keys and Gary Neville yet again. So you, you can't go wrong. It's like the perfect weekend. There's always a positive to Richard Keys uh, being <laughs> wound up to him, bastard. Um, Josh, um, I, I went to the game and it was electric. I think what the difference was with this game, which is really weird, is you've been to Arsenal games and normally people don't start getting to their seats maybe five minutes before the game. Like when the teams are maybe walking out and the Premier League music's playing, that's when people are walking there. And it was weird that I it took really long to get into the ground. And that's when you knew the ground, it was going to be a packed ground because it just took ages to get in there. And then we got up to your seat on the concourse. There was a Listen, there's 60,000 people in the stadium, so I expect there to be a load of people. But it just seemed like there was so much more. And I don't know if that kind of came through on the TV. That's the atmosphere. Um, the singing was loud. And even when we went one nil down, like the chanting that started happening, you would have thought that Arsenal scored, which was, was really, really good. Um, what was your sort of outlook on the game beforehand? Yeah, I think in terms of how I thought the game would go, I was a little bit worried purely for the sense that it's the only game we've lost this season is against United and it wasn't due to our performance. I think realistically we lost that game. It was additional intervention you know, from outside of our control. So it always felt like there's always that extra and I think it's always felt that way. You know, we can think back to... Um, 2006 um what was it, 2005 I'm trying to think when the 40 50th game was you know it's always been way back towards then and even just when historically we were the two biggest clubs in in england uh that there's always been that additional thing something intangible um i'm sure people will try and make it tangible for what man united have over arsenal either it was sir alex or the referees or 
something would never necessarily go our way. And we always go into that game feeling we're an underdog. And yeah, as John said, it kind of felt inverted from how you'd feel for a derby game. Uh, it felt more like a derby than the Spurs game uh, because we knew by far and away we were the better team against Spurs and the theory wouldn't trouble us much. But United, they kind of showed that they've been on the back of, what, 10 straight wins in the league um, against some pretty mediocre opposition. And I'm sure we'll touch on it um, later, but you have a look at the run that we've had and look for, look forward to other runs that we'll have in groups of fixtures. I don't think we'll find a harder run in the rest of the season than we do in this current January, where we are playing second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth. Um, it doesn't get more difficult than that. Some may go and look at the... You know, the teams that are there, but I think right now, halfway through the season, you've got to say the majority of teams that are there in that position are there on merit. Um, but yeah, I think the atmosphere in the ground was, it's been building up to that kind of level. And I think we'll see it now in a more, um, yeah, more often, certainly if they're going to start looking into safe standing as well, which I know is always the um, the underlying thing is that they want to improve the atmosphere there. And now if you've got proof that we've got the block of the Ashburton Army that are really bringing, and I think driving a lot of the atmosphere, which is then pushing around the ground and being able to add, maybe it's that block that becomes safe standing where they're standing or just have it at the other end of the ground, just having two banks of noise that can create that cacophony. You can see everything the players have been talking about, that the noise in the Emirates is really helping them. And partly, I think we have to thank the Amazon documentary for it, because I think that helped people understand. They were very frank and very clear about what they wanted to achieve in the Emirates and how crowd noise affects them even to the jokey um almost meme scenes of uh the anfield and uh the speakers there's arteta talking about you can put a player off his game and i think fans have taken that on board and going if i shout loud enough and back my team i could actually have a marked effect on the opposition I mean, Ben White did it to Sessignon when he tried to score mm. against us in the in the derby. He's got him yes. screaming at him as he takes the shot. So if Ben White can do it, imagine a stadium of sixty thousand people screaming at players. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, maybe maybe Sessignon's also a bit Spursy. That probably doesn't help him in that in that respect. But yeah, uh, I think there's that. You can see that we're energizing that team right now, and so say. Without a VAR intervention in that United game, we'd be, what, 19 games in and we'd still be unbeaten? Mm -hmm. If you think about mm -hmm. it that way, that's the yeah. only reason we lost a game is due to a VAR decision that they even say was wrong. Yeah, they said was wrong, didn't they? Yeah. And another penalty shot we had in that game, they also <clears> said <throat> was wrong. So, yeah, it, it shows how well we're playing at the moment is that it could be hilarious that Arteta could be saying at the end of this season, we can do one better and go for an invincible, much like Wenger did. Mm. Um, be before we jump on to anything else, I do want to talk about like individuals. Carl, you were in a stadium. Obviously, we're going to talk about Enketia because he's got two goals. But first, I want to talk about Starboy, uh, Saka. I know we're jumping in between the goals here, but what, like, what was your vantage point for? The the goal he scored because I the moment he hit that that ball the way he hit it even sitting at home I was like that's a goal and I started screaming my head off flatmates in the other room he had his headphones on he was watching the movie because he was making so much noise I heard him fall off his chair because I made so much noise <laughs> hit that ball but what was that like in a stadium just seeing Saka just get that because he'd been terrorizing Luke Shaw all game they couldn't get anywhere near him Luke Shaw had a torrid time in that game Maybe that's the reason why he's not playing tonight um, against Forest because he's still in recovery. But um, Saka just had him 
I think the phrase is, had him on toast. Because every time Saka got the ball, he just kept running at Luke Shaw. And all Luke Shaw kept doing is running back and back and back. And he wasn't trying to engage him because he knew as soon as he went by him, it was over. And Marcus Rashford wasn't really giving Luke Shaw that much help. I think the most times you'd see um, Fernandes try and come over. And sometimes Ericsson. But Ericsson is, you know, he's, he's not a defender in the slightest. It's just about a footballer. Um, so I think as when we Saka, I was up, um, I was up in the stands and I was um, top tier. And when he hit it, it almost seemed like it was taking ages for it to go in. Like it seemed like slow motion in real life. But when you, when it finally hit the net and it went in, I think the place erupted and it was like, oh my God. And the first thing you're doing, you're jumping up and down, you're celebrating with people, like even people you don't know who are next to you, you're hugging them. And that's the atmosphere in it. Like the people where I got my seats, um, their season ticket holders either side of me. And I was like jumping around with them. I was hugging them. Like they've never seen me before in their life. And that's the thing. Um, and I think everyone straight away turned to the big screens because everyone wants to see the replay. Everyone straight away wants to see the replay and was just watching. And I think they replayed it maybe about three or four times and every single time. It just looked better and better and better. Um, he is just an outstanding footballer. And it's really scary that he's so young. And I think really with him, the sky's the limit. There is n- so much that guy can achieve and hopefully he achieves it all with Arsenal. He is just so good. And I think you never see him upset. You always see him happy. And that's why everybody loves him. Even like, if you remember back to the World Cup and all the opposite, um, all the England teammates are talking about, oh, who would you like to date your daughter? Who would you like to take your sister out? And he all said Saka because he's just a nice person. And I think with him, I think he would do so well to stay with Arteta. And hopefully Arteta does become a manager for a long time. And, you know, in, in his development can go with Arsenal. But I think Saka, there is not a single left back in this league that's not scared of him. Nobody, and nobody wants to take him on because it doesn't matter what you do with him. You show him to the outside, he he'll hit with his left foot. You show him inside, he'll hit with his right foot. He'll get in there. He's so good at what he does, and I think to myself, we are so lucky to have someone like him because if they he was in the market and you were trying to buy someone like Saka, 20, 21 years old, um, can play either wing. So good. You are looking at literally over 100 million for Saka. His market value is over 100 million. There's no doubt about that. So, you know, the fact that he's come through our academy, I think it is so, so special. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that goal itself is incredible. And I think he said himself, it's the best goal he's ever scored. Um, Josh, being the, the hipster you are, as Carl said, Saka's 21. He's, I think he's 20. To in I think it's September or so it's like later in the year anyway. Um, so he's still got a long way to go. And you know, they say footballers, I think the age at which they at which they peak has maybe changed a little bit now, but you know, so let's say 26 to 28 range, maybe something like that. He's got years till he hits that. Like, so what is what is that kid's ceiling? You know, we like me and you, we watch other leagues and some lower league stuff and you see young players and you think, oh, well, that's a real talent. And sometimes you spot the right one and you see him go off to other bigger clubs and do stuff. Is Saka the sort of... To me, he's definitely got the mentality to keep pushing and keep going because he's very grounded and level-headed. And like Carl said, he's just a genuine nice guy, but he's a real killer on the pitch. So is it just a case of him working hard and he will be you know, in sort of conversations for things like Ballon d'Or and stuff like that for years to come? It's it's difficult with the kind of Ballon d'Or conversation because we've had that, what, just over a decade of Mm. two players dominating. It's not like the mid-90s where you'd get... Different one every year. A different one every year. It's the question on what happens when Messi, Ronaldo retire i guess mm. they probably already have from a ballon d'or conversation mm-hmm. benzema's probably out of it now the next kind of question is who's coming through is it mm. harlands or is it you're then looking someone like vinicius jr 
getting something them. like that could end up. It's that kind of conversation you're ending yeah. up. And Mbappe as well, of course. <clears throat> yeah. I think it purely then comes down to what they're doing at a club level. And if um, it could just be that kind of straight shootout between Man City and, and Arsenal mm. in terms of who achieves the most or in yeah. any given season that's what gets Haaland or Saka and it's between the two as a straight knockout yeah. it's whoever wins almost as lazy as it sounds whoever wins the Champions League it's probably the star young player that gets it and your assumption is Real Madrid PSG Man City or in a couple of years time through Saka's career yeah, Arsenal, maybe Arsenal. Arsenal, yeah. Arsenal were in conversation as well yeah but it's <clears throat> such a difficult place to be. Oh, and, and thinking of midfielders as well. Uh, you've got Pedri. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. You've got Barcelona. Some really good ones at Barca, yeah. But I, lot, I think yeah. I think there's a real argument that he should be the way he's performing, especially in big games as well. Um, mm. It's he should be in that conversation, or at least start to be in that conversation with the likes of Mbappe. And and those other guys that are all like always big names and always the first names out of people's mouths and they talk about best players in Europe at the moment. Obviously, Messi and Ronaldo were far and away the best two for a long, long time. Yeah. But as you say, they're towards the end of their career. Well, I mean, Ronaldo's quit football now, basically. But um, you know, Messi's still playing at least a little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, I think I think Saka really is putting himself in that conversation now. And, and I think the, yeah. and the thing is now, if he keeps scoring in big games and making the difference. That is what wins clubs trophies when they have that something extra special. Yeah, I think it's you've noticed that when he came into the England side, he wasn't the biggest name mm. in there. I think irrespective of allegiance, you'd still look at Harry Kane as being the focal yeah. point of the England national side. And there's still other players that are going in there. Sterling as well is taking a lot of pressure. Um, probably Maguire. Well, again, we're not talking about quality of player, but in terms of status and standing within that squad, yeah. you can see a lot of um, probably Messi and Ronaldo aside when you look at previous winners of the Ballon d'Or. Even actually, if you do look at Messi and Ronaldo, it's not always their best season where they've picked up that trophy. Yeah. And the same for Benzema as well. He was the biggest, the biggest status guy at Real Madrid mm -hmm. when people may argue that other players had better seasons. Yeah than him within that same squad. Saka feels like he's going to be in that position. I think there's always going to be an argument and I wouldn't be surprised if we see him get into the top three. <clears throat> I think there's yeah. been occasions where I've looked at Philip Lahm during the treble season. Um, mm. He should have won the Ballon d'Or that year and I won't take an argument anywhere. He was the best player in the world, but it was because he was a right back. He didn't get yeah. in the conversation. Um there's, I think that's where we'll be seeing Saka in a couple of years' time. He will be within that top three. Yeah. He, he's just incredible. And as Carl said, it's amazing that, not that we haven't spent any money of, on him, obviously, because we've been developing the player for a long time, but that he is our player and come through our yeah. academy. It's just, it makes it that much more special. Yeah. Um, it's think... great whenever you sign a big name player and it's always exciting, but to have him come through like that is 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 so so okay. good as i say we're at a club that's got ambition so uh, i'm sure some people have already mentioned about talking about players who could try and aim for individual honors <clears> at their <throat> team <laughs> um, <laughs> and maybe uh take that over uh team glory and i think you can see that saka kind of sees the holistic view of football is not just about individual uh honors yeah. and it's about the team and mm. uh I think that's where it kind of helps us in the sense of you can see whilst Arsenal were always going to be ambitious, Saka will be part of the club. It's as yeah. soon as we don't we stop meeting his expectations. And I mean, to be honest, his expectations are probably going to be where we're at at the moment, challenging for the title and probably challenging for the Champions League yeah. uh, eventually. But he's 21. Um, and I kind of see him similarly to probably someone like Gareth Bale in terms of at a club it's taken them to a level and then it mm. depends on where that club wants to go do they want to stick or twist yeah well hopefully the club keeps going the way it is and whilst Mikhail and Edu and Vinay and everyone and fair player will even chuck in Josh Cronkey's name as well with the backing of the funds and stuff um whilst they're pushing the club in the direction it's going 
Saka will be here and will help push the club forward. And yeah, I just hope he hits a, his peak with us because at 21, just uh, trying to imagine what he will be like in five, six years' time as a player. It's almost scary. He's really absurd, yeah. And that, it, and it's like they, like he he he's not Ronaldo, he's not Messi, and I don't think you can ever make direct player comparisons or anything like that. And I'm not saying he's going to be one of those type of guys either. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. Who knows? But it must be similar the way Arsenal fans feel about Saka now because of his age to the way they saw Ronaldo when he was that kind of age and Messi and stuff and how exciting and thinking about. Jesus Christ, what could this guy do in, you know, how many years' time if he's already this good? Uh, it's incredible. Um, another guy we should talk about who maybe will be in the conversation for England, if you're an England fan, you might care about this. If you're not an England fan, uh, then you won't care about it, is uh, the man that puts your defence in trouble because he's in the room, Eddie Nketiah. <laughs> um, I will just say briefly on this before it goes to the other guys, I was nervous when Jesus got injured, I think it's fair to say probably most people were. And not that I wasn't convinced that he could do it, but I thought, you know what, Eddie, I think he's good enough for the Premier League, but I don't know if he can do it in the biggest games. That was my one concern. I was like, he will, I know he's going to work hard and I know he's going to do everything the manager asks him, but I'm like, I don't know if he's definitely going to finish his chances. And we played Newcastle and he had a really tough game. You know, Newcastle, to be fair, they've got the best defence in the league and you can see why. And they are really difficult to play against, um, to, to score a goal anyway, at least. Um, you know, but I thought he worked really hard in that game. I thought he was great in the Spurs game. Should have scored maybe two. Um, you know, he'll probably, probably be disappointed in himself when he looks at some of the chances he had. But in this one... Uh, I listened to the Ask Blog podcast with Ian Wright, the little special they did this week. And it, Wright said, it said, if you can score against Man United, you can score against anyone because that gives you that belief. Is Eddie's been brilliant, hasn't he, Carl? The, the way he's playing. And if, if you said, you know, after a couple of games this season where you'd seen how much better we were with Zinchenko and Ze uh, Jesus, and I said to you, Oh, Jesus is going to be out of the team for three of our biggest games of the season against teams, and I suppose weren't in form, but Derby form sort of goes out the window. But Newcastle, Man United, you would have been really nervous if I told you it was going to have to be in Ketia playing and not Jesus, right? 100%. And yeah. I need to personally apologise to Eddie and Ketia <laughs> because <laughs> I remember being on a podcast with you, Josh, as well, and saying... I fear if Jesus gets um, injured because Eddie Nketiah is not up to scratch. He's not the guy that's going to take us on. And I was screaming about um, bringing in another striker. We were talking about bringing in a tall striker. We were talking about bringing in um, Calvert-Lewin, um, someone like that, because we just yeah. didn't think that Nketiah could do it. And he's proved, I think, everyone wrong, because I don't care. There's not one person who I think that was confident that he was going to, be this guy, be the person who, the player that he is today. And do you know what? He believed in himself and that's all we really need. Like you, people can talk about him all he wants and people can, people like me and all the rest of the people on Twitter and all the other um, social medias out there can talk about how he's not good enough. But he believed in himself and Arteta believed in him because that's the reason why they gave him a contract. That's the reason why they were literally begging him to stay at Arsenal. I mean, Enketa could have gone to Crystal Palace. He could have gone to, um, so many places. And I remember kind of when he went on loan to Leeds and then we brought him back. I mean, a lot of people then wrote him off as well, saying if you can't make it at Leeds, then you're not going to be able to make it anywhere. So, you know, he's come back and, he, and he's backed himself. And, and he's done so well. Like, um, I think I heard it on our cast um, saying that if you was to go and buy a striker, to score the goals that he scored at the moment, you're looking at 20, 25 million maybe. Um, and, you know, it's so good to see a, a homegrown talent come through the ranks. You know, he's waiting for his time and he's and he's about his time and he's, and he's coming and he's grabbed it with both hands and he's playing well. I mean, you know, we can talk about the standout games that he's done. You know, I remember the game against Chelsea where he scored two goals and 
for me, that was a brilliant time. And then there's times where he hasn't played very well, where he's kind of missed goals and missed opportunities. And you think, oh, come on, Eddie, you're better than that. But, you know, I remember he, he was on the podcast a while ago and he was saying, I need an opportunity. He's got the opportunity and he's now doing it. So I think Eddie Nketiah is one of those players where um, he's a form, not a form player, kind of... A, um, I was already looking for an encouragement player. So you give him encouragement, you give him the time and he'll go out and do the job. And the biggest compliment I can kind of give to him is if Gabriel Jesus was fit tomorrow, I don't think he gets back into the team. Not straight away, at least anyway, because you've got to go with your informed players. And Eddie Nketiah has gone out there and he's proved to everyone, proved to all his doubters, proved to all the supporters, proved to Mikel Arteta that he can do it. So... As much as, you know, people will be happy that Gabriel Jesus comes back in and he's not injured anymore, I think he rides the bench just for a little bit because Eddie Nketiah is, is at the moment, really, really well. And I think what's good is that you can take out someone like Gabriel Jesus and put in a almost ready-like replacement. And because they, I think the team is so well gelled together, it's almost like he's not left anywhere. I mean, yeah, you see all the fancy things that Gabriel Jesus does, closing down players, running back. But Eddie Nketiah does that as well. But the thing is with Eddie Nketiah is he scores goals as well. And, you know, Gabriel Jesus had that little run just before he got injured, where just before the World Cup, sorry, where he wasn't scoring goals. He, he you know, he had a, a barren spell. I can't remember how many games he went without scoring. I'm sure it was like maybe five or six or maybe even more. Um, and Eddie Nketiah is going out there week after week and yeah, he didn't score in the Spurs game but like you said, you go against Man United you got to score two goals against Manchester United at home and you score a 90th minute winner those are folklore goals because those are goals that people are always going to oh, remember yeah. you know what I mean? Like, it's almost like you remember when Danny Warbeck scored that last minute goal against um, Leicester you oh, always remember yeah, that goal yeah. so that, you, that that goal you're going to stay all, there yeah. yeah, and that's one against Manchester Manchester United you're always going to remember that goal mm-hmm. people are always going to remember oh do you remember that 90th minute goal that Eddie Nketiah scored so um, I'm happy with his performance and, and long may it continue because again where's his ceiling mm-hmm. how good can Eddie Nketiah be as well like mm-hmm. we're not at the moment, we're not saying he's going to be the next, I don't know, Ronaldo, yeah. uh, original mm. Ronaldo. But, you know, this guy is doing well at the moment. I feel like with Eddie, he still needs to be shown something to p- believe it. Uh, I'm still critical of what he did at Leeds. Not because he didn't make the team. Um, we know what Bielsa, if you know Bielsa, you know that he is very steadfast to his starting eleven. There is no shifting with that. But what he would have learned is from rather than coming back early, uh, he would have learned how to do things like build up play uh, a lot sooner than he's now learned them. And I think if we didn't sign Jesus and we had a different style of striker, one that had a completely different body shape to Enketia, let's say, for example, Dusan Vajovic. Mm. Um, who we were linked with last January, and instead we ended up with Jesus. I don't think Enketia is that player because I think he's still got to be someone that sees it to believe it. We we saw something close to the Enketia last season. I think I remember the cameo he made at Everton where he came on at left wing mm. and started uh, started the bit of interplay. But I think Jesus coming in, him training with uh, Enketia day in day out has clearly made an impression on him. And yeah. that's, I think, where we're seeing the player. The interesting thing that, Carl, you say is Jesus wasn't scoring goals, but he was assisting. And we've got the opposite with Nketiah. I think mm. Jesus is, what, on eight assists for us yeah, this something season? Like that. It's yeah. something insane that, yeah, he's got maybe five goals, but he's got eight assists. And that's basically a creative player for us. Mm. That is an Odegaard or uh, Saka or maybe even Martinelli kind of numbers that you would expect well, that was for our central striker. Now we've tilted a little bit and we've got Nketiah scoring the goals, but not necessarily creating as often, which I don't think is a bad thing. We're obviously mm. winning games. It's not a bad thing. But that's the thing that I'd want to just add to where Nketiah's ceiling would be. It depends the players he's playing with. I think right now, the longer he spends with Jesus is he becomes that Jesus kind of player. 
Yeah. And if you brought in an example, if he played with Messi, I think he'd bring in parts of Messi's game. Or you brought in someone else, you know, diminutive forward player, he would mm. start to bring on those attributes. Um, yeah. I think that's what I see from him is he's a really good sponge of other players who he can liken his ability to. But um, yeah, I would have to put my hands up and I can't come on here and suddenly say, I backed Eddie from the hill. Where <laughs> <you> could... <laughs> it's the downside of our podcast is that somebody could go back and find every single, no, every single time really we've slammed where a player. I, <laughs> where I have slammed in Ketia, yeah. said I'd get rid of him. Because yeah. there was a point I would get rid of him. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Even in the, before he signed his deal. Mm. I mean, one thing I do in the kind of, I would laugh at is I did say that if we got, if he went in the summer and he ended up going to an English team, they would be paying the highest compensation ever mm. for an English player. Uh, and people laughed at me and said it wouldn't be that high. So I suppose I'm half right. So that's a little <laughs> victory I'll take from it. <laughs> but maybe it would be 20, 25 million we'd get. But yeah, as you say, Carl, to try and get a striker like that now, especially in the January window, mm. it's not happening for silly money or you're getting him on loan covering his entire wages for six months. He's going to get yeah. sent off in his first game and then go back to Atletico <laughs> Madrid and sign a contract <laughs> extension. <laughs> no names mentioned, obviously. No, no, no uh, names mentioned. No, no. Yeah, I mean, like... I'm so I'm really pleased for Eddie because you know he's he's an Arsenal boy like Saka is like Emil, um, you know, and when you've got big legends like Ian Wright and stuff, always talked about him, always said how well he wants him to do and everything. And for someone like Eddie, that must be amazing. And towards the end of last season, he was talking about you know Eddie had that good run of goals, and then the the team as a whole, and it wasn't in Ketia's fault, but the team as a whole ran out of steam, and obviously we just fell short. And uh, right, he was on Ask Blog and he said, you know, I felt like he wasn't quite pushing enough. He turned things around. He got his new contract. Um, so, you know, credit to to uh, Arteta and Edu as well, because like like you both said, if you go, if you even in the summer, if you try to sign a striker, um, let's say you went with like an older guy, someone who, I don't know, uh, say you went with, not that you would, but just as an example, like a Danny Ings type, someone who scored goals everywhere he's gone, but he knows he's going to be second striker and only coming on that kind of thing. You've got to pay the fee for the player. You've got to pay the agent. And then you've got to do his wages on top. Whereas with Inketia, it was sign a new deal. Yeah, we're going to give you a nice pay bump, but that's it. There's nothing else. We haven't got to worry about any other money. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not exciting. It's not flashy. It's not a big name or anything else like that. But he's come in and absolutely done the business. And I think, yeah, there is a question about when Jesus is fit again. Do you drop him straight back in? Do you go? Oh, you know what? Um, maybe in this game, Jesus comes on, but at first Eddie stays in the middle and Jesus plays out left for a bit, and then then we take Eddie off and push Jesus le- uh, to the middle and bring on a Trossard or Smith Rowe or you know whoever else. Um, it's it's now what I feel like is because of the way he's playing, I think, and we're getting to the point of the season where we are going to start to have the cup games and everything else. So when Jesus comes back, Eddie's not going to have those long stretches where he's out of the team, um, you know, and he's only getting 10, 15 minutes. It's probably going to be Jesus for one game, Eddie for another. And I'm not going into a game going, I really like Eddie and I hope he does well, but I'm not sure if he's going to do it. Now I'm going into a games and I'm like, yeah, Eddie's gonna gonna score, you know. The, the the bet I put not I'm not encouraging gambling kids. Um definitely don't do it. But the the bet I put on was part of it was Eddie to score a goal because I was just like I just got a feeling he's gonna score a goal because he's been playing so well he deserves one, you know. And, and he didn't get them in the last couple of games, but I was so confident in this one that he was definitely gonna do it. So um that song has been going around my head all week. Uh, thank you, Jason <laughs> Davies, for keep posting it and sending me videos and constantly and stuff of it. Oh, it's, it, it's doing my head in. I can't get out of my head, but I'm really pleased for him and it's brilliant. And and maybe this now, you know, maybe he will get his England call up um and get into the first team because I mean, other I, than Kane, he's got he what he is the most informed English striker, I guess. Yeah, I would recommend to Inketia um, <laughs> really Not- just to target either playing in the next World Cup mm. if you want to. You might get a chance in the Euros, 
but if you mm. can't be bothered to wait because he'll be 27 by the next World Cup, it's 23 yeah, 27, already, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that he might as well just declare for Ghana. Um, yeah. <laughs> just do that instead. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting to think that when the Cup games come back, what I would probably do is play Jesus in the Europa League. Because yeah, just to get if you in, remember yeah. right, if you remember right back to the beginning of the season when Eddie was in that Europa League playing mm. with the less quality, less able, yeah, less yeah. able creative yeah. players, he he looked awful. But yeah. I think if you bring Jesus into a side that's got Vieira, Smith Rowe, and um, Trossard in it, Trossard. that's yeah. gonna click a lot yeah. better. Yeah, it's um, true. And no, Eddie's think, Eddie's shown yeah. he can do it in the league against the exactly. best team. So, yeah, keep um, him there. Jesus powers us through because I think yeah. we should still be fighting. You can see that's what we're clearly doing at the trying moment. To fight we're trying to for fight for the Europa League and yeah. and the league. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think the the interesting thing as well is obviously Jesus is a ways off yet, but this game shows that what having just even one change uh, for an attacker can do. Um, Gabriel Martinelli, I thought he was fine in the game. It, it definitely wasn't his best game ever. I thought Wamba Zaka, to be fair to him, did very well against him. And he'd done well the week before against Wilfred Zaha as well, um, you know, one on one. And Trossard coming on obviously made his debut. We'll talk about him in general. We'll get Josh's, Josh's thoughts on that, obviously. Um, but he did come on, and he had an effect, and he was involved in the goal. So just having that ability just to change something off the bench and have something a little bit different in attack can make the difference in games. And as we are doing so well at the moment, when we are playing the teams who are, you know, sort of 10th to 12th or lower down the table, they're going to be sitting in that low block. So when Jesus is back, you might see games where we've seen Arteta do it, I think he's done it twice already, where he's played Jesus and Nketiah together and almost played a 4-4-2, um, which I think is really interesting because, as you say, the way Jesus helps in the build up and Eddie loves to be in the box and his movements getting better and better. And they're definitely were starting to, you know, having him at the club has definitely been rubbing off on Anketia in a positive way. Um, so I think that's another really good thing for us in attack. Um, we, we talk about Trossard, Josh, mm. obviously we were, our, our eyes were set on a young Ukrainian man and it all looked like it was going to eventually happen. And then some mad American came in and said, hang on a minute, I can pay you all this money up front and don't worry, it's not a Russian's money. So it's all right now. It's fine. You can take it. Um, he did say with the caveat that you do a really weird PR article in the Athletic <laughs> yeah, where yeah. you say, I'm amazing yeah. and yeah. also I've got a massive cock. If you could mention that, that would yeah. be great. Thank it was you very, 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 very odd. But I must, it is, it is nice though that Shakhtar are donating part of the money to the uh, Ukrainian, uh, I think it's oh, uh, except it's not the money from that tran- except yeah, it's not it's the from, money from that transfer fee. Yeah, it's somewhere, from somewhere else. It's definitely not that money, but it is that yeah, money. But it's not but that it money. Is that money. I mean, it's not that money. <laughs> but at least it's going to a good cause. Um, yes. But yeah, so we didn't get Madrid, but in previous years the club would have, or club has as a rule, sort of put his eggs all in one basket and. Higuain was on the plane but never turned up. Benzema was coming for six years and never arrived. Um, Lamar was 50 50, but it turned out it was 0 0. Um, yeah, the, the list goes on and on. Yan and Via, they, there's been a lot yeah. of them. And he's still having his medical, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Apparently, what, what generally would yeah. happen is the transfer would fall through and nothing. And that isn't the case now. The club immediately went, right, okay. Lick our wounds. We'll get this game out of the way at the weekend. And we got a lovely result yeah. against the scum. Um, and everyone was in a good mood. And then he went, right, we'll go and get this guy. Because he's been on our list and we've been watching him for a long time. He's Premier League proven. He's ready. Uh, so, Josh, tell us everything that's wrong with Leandro Trossard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, right. <laughs> I don't think I'm at humble pie stage yet right now, um, but there was definitely a lot of aggressive. Let's just say if you thought um, I was aggressive about not wanting Trossard at the club on Twitter, you should have seen the WhatsApp groups. Oh, um, Jesus. Yeah. I was not happy about Trossard coming in. Um, and I think the best way I can shape it is with the term I've dubbed him is the Belgian Arshavin. But I suppose what I've now come round to the way of thinking and something I didn't actually realize was that um, Bert 
were um, assistant manager at Genk when Trossard was there. Yeah, yeah. So obviously knew the player, um, and I can't quite remember what um, the Brighton fans nickname for him. It was the vampire from somewhere is what we called um, <laughs> Trossard. And I can't remember which Belgian town it was named after, but you can see why. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, um, I can see he's one of those hot and cold players. Everybody was going, oh, he's got a hat trick against Liverpool. I'm like, look at the right back there. Uh, everybody is scoring a hat trick against Alex Arnold <laughs> at the moment. Um, and the reason why Brighton was so happy to let him go, I mean, you saw what Matoma did to mm. Trossard. Um, yeah. Uh, not Trossard, did to um, Alex Arnold only two weeks ago. Yeah, they were fine with letting go a player that, to be honest, had been stinking up the joint for this entire season. Um, his best performances were away from home against clubs who are more open against teams like Brighton. Mm. Um, so that's where my reticence was about him coming into Arsenal because when Arsenal play against Leicester City, for an example, Leicester are playing very differently against Arsenal as they are against Brighton. There's going to be a bit, a bit more space for Trussell to operate in one of those games versus the other. And he's not great at picking locks. And I think that was my biggest worry for us was that it seemed like we were crying out for either someone just like Martinelli in terms of a goal-scoring winger um, who could also create. I have noticed actually since Jesus has come out of the side, um, Martinelli stopped playing that kind of cross to the back post. Yeah. That doesn't happen at the moment. Yeah, um, he's not getting that same run, is he? Yeah. yeah. So he seems to be a bit more one-dimensional. Um, and maybe that's a little bit about being a bit jaded from the world cup i think we saw it with saliba as well that actually the world cup did those two no favors at all yeah um but yeah that's where i kind of see arshavin he'll have a cult moment for arsenal i can see it happening and to be honest it makes me relaxed in the sense of i now know that martinelli's going nowhere or they don't see martinelli going everywhere if mudrick came in would he really would i want to be spending a hundred million pounds on a player to sit behind Martinelli. Yeah. Uh, especially with how much I like him. Um, I don't want to see him leave. Uh, you know, I've got mm. the same love of Marty that I do for Saka on the other wing. As I yeah, don't he's, he almost feels like all. an academy player because we got him Definitely. so young. Yeah. Got him so young. We sniffed him out. He seems homegrown in the kind of Anelka kind of seems like he yeah, came through yeah, yeah. from us. Yeah. You know, or Vieira as well. Mm. Vieira feels like he's Arsenal. Yeah. Um, so that's my kind of reticence. But when I kind of think about it in the nice way of going, he is a good upgrade on Reese Nelson. Mm. That's where I'm thinking of it from that um, that perspective. And I'll come to Archangel's question, I think, in the um, chat yeah. about how Brighton keep doing that when it comes to the question yeah. section, um, because it's not a short answer. Mm. But yeah, in terms of Trossard, they've. Brighton have made back and turned a profit on a player that they bought three seasons ago. Mm. Um, so I think everybody is generally happy. I think he'll help us in the terms of, you know, when I just named that Europa League front four, mm. that sounded a lot nicer than um, even just switching out Trossard for Nelson. Is yeah. there was a little bit more of an anxiety of would that take us through to the even the semi final game? Could we yeah. play that lineup in the semi? It's, it's like, a step. It's a step above yeah. Nelson and Marquinhos, and yeah, definitely. And that's where I kind of see him. Um, you know, we've already seen the little um, cameo that he made and the influence that he can make. But mm. to be honest, if I'm talking about the influence of any player that was key to that third goal, we've got to talk about the other Ukrainian, the one who unfollowed Modric. Oh, um, I think I. <laughs> Simon and I, um, I think we started up the uh, Sinchenko to Arsenal fan club um, right at the beginning um, because he was just a player. You could see it in the Euros, even if he was just playing in midfield. What a player, what desire he's got. And you can see he is that other leader on the pitch. I mean, Mm. if you could think of getting a player who's got better leadership qualities and is a better left back than Kieran Tierney, you'd be calling me mental. Yeah. Um, 
but Zinchenko's come in, changed the way we play. I think more so than Jesus has in- bettered that mentality. You can see the videos that are going around, even from the all or nothing when he was at City, yeah. of how key he was in terms of the boy gives a good team talk. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's, well, and it's fine, right, for being too passionate. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's mad. Um, yeah, Carl, I right, I have never had a man crush on an uglier human being. Um, and I mean that in the nicest sense, like he's not an ugly bloke, but he's like you get a man crush on, like a Ryan Reynolds, or, you know, like a good looking dude who's funny, like oh, he'd take you out for a nice dinner and he'd give you a hug, you know, he, he's not right. Zinchenko's not an attractive man, but the things he does on a football pitch as a I mean, I don't, I don't want to call him a left back. It seems almost insulting. I don't know what position <laughs> he plays. And I, I don't mean it as a disrespect to left backs either, because I think there's amazing left backs. But it's ridiculous. I mean, th- there's a very attractive That's man ridiculous. on the screen. If, if you're only listening, <laughs> if you're only listening, listeners, then you're missing out on a beautiful picture right now on the YouTube. Um, I have not been to Arsenal yet this season. So I have not seen our Ukrainian. Uh, superstar in the flesh. What is it like sitting in a stadium and seeing a guy who is allegedly playing left back pop up on the right wing and the opposition team have no idea what to do with him or who's marking him? Because he he looks absolutely insane whenever I see him on the pitch. It's it's nuts. Joe, you know it seems so simple because you think you would say, we know Zinchenko likes to pop up in midfield and almost become a midfield three with Partey and Granite Xhaka. So you think you'd say to yourself, if you're the opposition team, I know I'm going to park somebody on the right-hand wing, so their right-hand wing, and just stay there. And your job is when you get the ball, you're going to be the outlet because we know that Zinchenko is going to be somewhere in midfield. And if you stay wide, then we can get the ball to you and you just run. So it sounds simple, doesn't it? Like because technically that's what should happen. Problem is you can have a plan, but you can't execute it because you may think that he's in midfield and you think that he's part of the midfield free, and sometimes he's playing right next to Granite Xhaka or he's playing right next to Thomas Partey. But then you think, okay, I'm gonna stay wide, and all of a sudden he's up with you. Like, I don't I honestly don't rate Anthony whatsoever. I think um Anthony from Manchester United is a hundred million of flop. Hundred million, and it's not being spoken. It's not being spoken about enough. I'm sorry. Can I? Like he does. Go on, sorry, Josh. I just interject just on that. On um, can we all just revel in the fact that after 45 minutes, Zinchenko realised there was no point marking him. He could just do what he wanted, and it would be no threat. <laughs> <laughs> he just went. He just went. Oh, oh, that guy's just. What do they call him? The Brazilian fidget spinner. Uh, <laughs> But that's what he is. Like, I don't understand that. And it's not being spoken about enough. That like, 100 million that guy cost. And that's the reason, or part of the reason, why we didn't get Mudric. Because um, they Shaktar, inflated the market. Shaktar, yeah. Shaktar was saying, well, if Anthony's worth 100 million, then what's Mudric worth? But mm. Anthony's not worth 100 million. Man United paid 100 million for him. There's a massive, massive difference. Almost the same as Pepe. Pepe wasn't 72 million, but we ended up paying 72 million mm. for him. But Going back to uh, Zinchenko, um, Anthony, like you, Josh was saying, Zinchenko ended up playing in midfield all the time because there was no point in even thinking about where Anthony was because it was ridiculous. And the fact that Thomas Partey, who's not the blessed with pace, uh, can catch up to Anthony and tackle him, kind of says it all, kind of says what that player is. I mean... One, he needs a better skincare routine because his skin is awful. But, um, <laughs> like, he, I don't understand why people go on about him or kind of what uh, Ten Hag is seen in him. Like, I understand that he played with him in in um, in the Eredivisie, but this ain't the Eredivisie. This is the Premier League. And there are two different kettle of fishes. And, you know, you could do all the tricks and spins all you want, but if you can't even cross the ball into the box, if you can't outpace Thomas Partey, if you can't make a run for your teammates, then what are you? But going back to Zinchenko, he's just... he. I don't want to call him a utility player because I think that's kind of a disservice, but he is because he can do everything. He can play in midfield, he can play in 
left back. He can play sort of centre back. He can pop up a left wing. Like he's just the things that he does is brilliant. And it, I, I guess what well, I, I want to kind of speak on the, some pundits, um, mainly you know G Neville. Uh, the fact that you play football doesn't mean that you can comment on football or that your mm. football knowledge is vast. You know, I think I saw like a highlight reel of all this stuff that Gary Neville said that's turned out to be wrong. You know, he, he thinks he's this fountain of knowledge that he knows certain things. And I just don't understand where he says, oh, Zinchenko is not a leader. Like, how did, he never he doesn't know anything about football because like, I'm sure if he'd done his research, like a good pundit slash journalist would do, he would have spoken to someone in Man City and said, What's that guy like? And someone, is, someone would have said, "Oh, he's you know he's passionate. He 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 does give good team talks, but he's basing this on absolutely nothing." Yeah, because I, he doesn't know anyone in Man City. He doesn't know what Zinchenko's like. So to come out and say, "Oh, I don't know why Arsenal are buying him," blah blah blah. Like the guy is brilliant, and if he is only the fact that he hasn't scored, why he's not being spoke about for probably um, player of the season because it's the little things he does and he's just brilliant. I mean, people who are listening, like you're not going to be able to see this, but if you look watching on YouTube, there's a heat map that Danny's put up of Zinchenko and he's very rarely in that right, sorry, left back position. Mm. Like he's all over the place. Yes, he's dominating the higher part of the left midfield, but he's also on the right, he's up front, he's in the opposition box. I mean, how He's in the times? opposition box on the right wing. It's for a left for a guy who starts at left back. It's crazy, and we and, just, and the and the team doesn't look like it's out of shape or anything. Everyone knows where they're going, and it, but he is just. He's amazing on the ball, and like like every player, he makes mistakes, and obviously, everyone does it. Doesn't matter how good you are, you can misplace a pass or whatever. But he seems. Um, like you were talking about with Anthony Cole, they, they, I think there was a bit where I don't know if Anthony had annoyed him or said something to him, but he just went, oh, I'm just gonna take the ball past you and just embarrass you now. And he just like blitzed past him and like two other United players just burst into midfield and then you know, like re- releases Xhaka and gets another attack moving. And I, I like you, you said earlier, and I think you put it really well, Carl, that Jesus obviously was the sort of the focus of a lot of people's talk at the start of the season with Arsenal and how well we're doing because it's like he's transformed the team and the forward line and everything else and it's true and he was incredible for us even in that spell where he wasn't scoring goals he was still doing so much for the team but I don't think people have really noticed until now how good Zinchenko is like really how good he is and how much influence he has on the team and there was a period of this season where he wasn't in the team at all where we didn't have him as well you know, so we we've gone through this season with our two new signings out for quite long stretches of it at different times, and we're still winning games, and they've really brought something to that dressing room. And you see all the guys, didn't you, like Saka and Ketia? You see Saliba talk about it, Ben White, Park, whoever it is, they all talk about the influence that Jesus and Zinchenko have brought in in the dressing room. Um, to the mentality of the team and the players, and Arteta obviously knew that from his time at Man City. And I, I think as much as they do on the pitch, and obviously that's you know that is the most important bit what you go out there and do. I think they're just as important off the pitch because they're still only young as well. They're both what 20, 25, 26 ish, something like that, aren't they? I think both of them. Not yet. Um, but they've won things. They've won titles. They've won trophies. They know how to get over the line, and the mentality thing that they've brought to to the players and everything. Is incredible. The 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 quote I've seen going around at the moment from Zinchenko. I think it was after the Man United game he did an interview, and he said um, that uh, when they were sort of talking one day either in training or something like that, and uh, they were sort of having the conversation about oh like uh, we're going for top three this season and everything else, and he said no 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 guys we're not going for top three we're going to win the title, and he said that you know some of the players sort of laughed at him when he said it, and then he just said to the guy in the interview he said no one's laughing now. We're going for the title. I I love him. I absolutely love him. And the oh, the way he celebrates goals as well is just is so good because you can see it. He like he gees the crowd up and everything. He's always trying to get people going. And like in this Man United game, you know, we go a goal down, and him Erdegaard. There's so many leaders on the pitch now. Going no, no, no. We don't panic. This is not Arsenal of old. This is not where we go. Oh, 
we've got a goal behind. We don't know what to do. We, maybe we can be lucky and scrape a draw. It's like, no. We go, we play the way we're going to play. This is what we're here to do. We know we can beat this team with our style of football. And they just bring that energy and belief onto the pitch. And I, I, I think th those two guys in particular have, have just been incredible. But like everyone on 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 that Sunday, I thought everyone played really well. Um, like obviously, you know, Tommy Yasu was coming on. Erdogan was brilliant. Part A start the first half wasn't his best game, but second half really started to boss it. Xhaka all game was making incredible runs, dragging the defense all over the place, making space for Zinchenko or Martinelli or Eddie. Um, the guys at the back were brilliant. Uh, Ramsdale. Shut up and Tommy Yasu as well. The fact that he came on yeah. and he kept Marcus Rashford quiet for the whole I didn't. Half. I didn't, yeah, didn't see Rashford again in that game when Tommy Yasu came. That was it. He was like, yeah, done. You're, you're out of this game now. Ramsdale, when he was called upon, made some big saves, you know. Um, so, yeah, the, the whole team just absolutely brilliant. Um, and the the, I mean, my favourite, my favourite moment. Well, my favourite moment was Eddie scoring the winner, obviously, and I went mental. And then there was a the whole VAR check and stuff. I'm like, no, 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 no. And then it was, it was allowed. But after the game, and about five, ten minutes afterwards, I saw it on Twitter, and it was Richard Quees tweeting, "Did anyone see if Zinchenko was offside in that goal?" I was like, "The man's clinging. He's like begging for anything to turn this club. It's so good." I, I, I honestly, I want, I want a live camera. If we, if we win this the league this season, and like, and it's not a foregone conclusion. It's not any more games to go. Just enjoy the ride. You know, don't get carried away ever. I think we've got a good chance, obviously. But Man City are a brilliant team, and you know that they're, they're gonna improve on their performances. I'm sure. Um, but if we do win it, I just want a live feed of Richard Key's face, like the moment that final whistle blows, and it's like official. And just like what, watch a video of Keys watching Arteta celebrating out of his technical area. <laughs> <laughs> just see like all the hair on his hands just fall out of his body or something. I don't know. I think <laughs> I, think I so just good. like them just to send an Arsenal shirt to is he Al Jazeera that he's on or uh, BN Sports? Oh, BN Sports. Yeah, yeah, BN yeah. Sports. Just yeah. just send uh, just send a parcel to him, but just yeah. Keys. However old he is, fifty-seven oh, okay. on the back do of the, the brain and the heart, you know, holding hands Maybe. or hugging or whatever. It is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just like keys and keys and Arteta, a little hug. <laughs> oh, it's it's so good. I love and I love it. Like I used to kind of mm. dislike it when the media would kind of gang up on us and take the piss and everything. But it's because we weren't we weren't doing anything. Now it's like anything, just chip away at Arsenal as much as you can, yeah. and it's having no effect. And I'm no. absolutely but loving the stick we're getting. Great. Do you think they do it on purpose because they know the reaction? Arsenal will have one of the, mm. if not the, biggest fan bases oh, on yeah. social media. Yeah. On Twitter. Yeah. So they know that, you know, it boosts their hits and clicks. Yeah, of course. So it's, Richard it's all Keys about... comes out and says yeah. something mm. bad. He knows he's going to get so much interaction with yeah. Arsenal fans mm. because um, of the shit that he says. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's to drive, it's, yeah, to drive traffic and everything else. And, for, you know, for, they're there to make money and whatever, get paid. So, you know, you do what you do. But they, they need a story. And Arsenal being top of the league was not the story they had written for this season. This this season was supposed to be about how amazing is Erling Haaland? Um, what happens? Can Liverpool push again City for the title with their mm -hmm. supposedly limited funding compared to City or whatever, which is kind of a joke considering how much they spent... Mm -hmm. And will Chelsea all of a sudden turn it round? You know, Potter coming in and Todd Bowley spending and the, all his uh, money. Don't forget the um, oh, the, the new refer parcel. referees. I was going to say referees friend um, and good <clears throat> humble guy Antonio Conte and the oh, um, of course, yes, yeah. magical Spurs would be leading him to yeah. um, Mag to magical glory. Spurs. Yeah, magical yeah. Spurs. There'd be no no issues there. Uh, oh, no God. corruption. Yeah. No no problem at all with their ties with Juventus. Nope. Yeah. Every every single time, every single time. Um, right, that that's sort of it for the game. We'll jump into questions. Before we do that, we did have another signing. Um, I've forgotten the guy's first name. I know his Jakob. surname is Jakob. There we go, Jakob Kibior uh, from Spezia. Um, do either of you know anything about this player? He's Polish. Uh, I reckon he's called Kuba for short. That amount. That's it. Okay, he's, um, he's left footed. 
He played I'll for Spezia. <laughs> I'll try and take it from here. But I'm not and a defender. Lie. Yeah, yeah. But he I'm played in midfield last season. Yeah, I, I don't know too much. <laughs> I've only seen Spezia probably two or three times a season. Um, I've seen him a little bit. Um, he looks quite good. He's still very young, obviously. He's already in the national team for Poland. I uh, think it's nine or ten appearances. Mainly, he played I every think... game in the World Cup. He did play every game, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's only played sort of as the left side centre back at the moment for the national team. For Spezia, he's played centre back. I think he's played a game at left back. He's definitely played in midfield. I think he even played one or two maybe at left mid. I'm sure I definitely saw him at left mid in one game. Um, what I would say is he looks like he can read the game well. His passing and technical ability all seems up to scratch and very sort of Arteta profile kind of player. He, to me, from like, I, I'm not watching as much Italian football as I was previously, so I, I don't know as much about him as I would maybe years ago. Um, he, to me, feels very much like a Tommy Yasu sort of signing in the sense that He's a guy who's got that ability that can play centre-back, left-back, can play midfield, um, will be confident on the ball, will be able to pass it around. Um, whether he's going to stay and play primarily as a centre-back or whether he will be playing more as a midfielder or whether he's uh, left-back or something, I, I genuinely I don't know. I'm guessing it's more as a cover for Gabriel. Um, how much of him this season we'll see, I, I really don't know. Um, maybe some minutes in cups and things like that. I don't think you're going to see him start for a while. But if he turns out the way other Arteta signings have turned out, and Eddie signings, uh, and in particularly in the way that Tommy Asu has turned out, who I think surprised a lot of people with how good he was when he came in. Um, I don't think people look at Serie A as quite the... I mean, it definitely isn't the league it used to be like in the 90s. But they're still very good players in that league. Um, and the other really good thing... Uh, I would say, is that we weren't the only team in for him. Dortmund wanted him um, and a few other big clubs. So the fact that we got him um, is a really good sign. It's a uh, low fee. The wages aren't high. It's one of those guys where if it works out, and I really hope it does, it's brilliant for us and we've got a long-term player. If it doesn't quite work out, it's the sort of guy that in three years' time you can sell and still turn a profit on kind of in the way we've done deals like with Tavares and with Laconga. I've got higher hopes with Kivior than than with those two players I just mentioned, I'll be honest. Um just because I'd see I've seen more of him than I had of those when they first came in. Um but I'm not gonna lie, I don't know a ton about him. Um I'm sure there are some people who've probably done some really good threads and stuff on him. Uh, there is a guy I follow on Twitter uh who does Italian football uh, player analysis. So if I can re if I find him again, I'll put it out on my Twitter account. Um I think it's more competition, isn't it? Because let's face it, Gabriel, I think he hasn't kind of, got he hasn't really got any competition, has he? No, nah, I can't remember yeah. I heard from he's started 56 mm. um Premier League games in a row, which one is <laughs> credit to him. Well, yeah. apart from being obviously sent off and serving yeah. um yeah. bands and stuff, which is testament to him. Um, but he does need some sort of um, competition because whenever we play cup games, it's either Rob Holding and another, either mm. Rob Holding and um, Gabriel or Rob Holding. Um, so Gabriel has and played. Ev mm. As I say, Gabriel's played all but one of our games this season. Yeah, and that was the game where we started Saliba and. Um, uh, uh, holding together. Mm. So Danny's got the list up there just of Premier League, but uh, Gabriel's also played five games in Europa League yeah. as well as the other cup games. <clears throat> yeah, so Even I think... Needs a rest, it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So I think the fact that you've then got... If you look at... Um, not that you have two 11s as such, but if you took our, what our starting 11 is and you said it was Jesus was the starting number nine normally would be uh the team we've got out at the moment basically would be the starting 11 but jesus would be in for in for Inketia. then if you said okay what would our backup be if kivior comes in you've got turner in goal um you've got obviously tierney you have kivior you'd have uh you can have tommy yasu as your right back or your center back 
I think if we sign this guy from Valladolid, um, <laughs> is it Fresneda? Fresneda. Yeah, yeah. Fresneda. Um, obviously, he'll be going back on loan to Valladolid. That is the talk anyway for the rest of the season and then would join up with us. If we did get him, then I could see Tommy Yasu being the... He will be back up for Ben Wright when needed, but I think more likely he will end up moving into the centre and will be Saliba's cover and then uh, Fresneda would be Ben White's cover. So that's uh, another back four of still good players, but some younger ones with promising talent. Um, you know, you've got Smith Rowe for Erdegaard, you've got Trossard for Martinelli, uh, you've got Enketia for um, for Jesus. The question marks still come over, do you need an extra wide player in terms of cover for Saka? Um, obviously, you've got Nelson and Marquinhos. Um, or and then obviously central midfield is is the big one. Yeah. I think the the way they're building the squad now, you can almost see that second eleven is is nearly there. Like it's nearly there, and it's still some very good players. Um, obviously, there was lots of talk about Declan Rice coming in uh, in the summer. That's like apparently our big move. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But if that does happen, then obviously it bumps one of Jacka or Parte possibly into that second team or it means you can rotate more. So that really strengthens the whole squad. Um, so it's, in terms of transfers, I think it's all really, really good news at the moment. I think I just want to touch on the centre midfield mm. um, thing because I don't know if anybody saw um, Arteta's press conference today or it mm-hmm. saw um, Simon Cronings' team. Oh, sorry. Team I, I left out, uh, sorry, left out Vieira, obviously would be the other wide player. My bad. Completely forgot. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Go on, Carl. Um, and I think Arteta's really worried about um, El Nene. The fact that he was saying that, you know, El Nene doesn't really complain about stuff um, mm. and he's complained about pain. So, which kind of indicates he may need surgery. Mm. And if that does happen, that leaves us very, very short in the centre yeah. midfield. I mean, um, as much as people really, really want the Conga to kind of be this good player or the player that people think he is, I don't think he is. I just can't see it. I mean, he's been at the club for a very long time now and he feels like he needs a loan somewhere. He feels like he needs to yeah. go out on loan and play week in, week out. But at the moment, because we have sort of no bodies in the centre midfield, centre midfield, that's why we have to keep him. Mm. So... I'm just really I'm worried just a little bit about um, whether we're going to get another player in. I mean, there's been so much talk of different players coming in. Um, there's talk about Calcedo from uh, Brian, which Josh will probably touch on. There's talk about um, Onana from Everton and mm. Everton are in absolute turmoil at the moment. And we do have players um, that can play in centre midfield, but um, I still think that we are quite short in centre midfield, and you know it's a worry. It's a worry because every time Thomas Partey sort of you know goes down, rubs his leg, everyone kind of breathes mm. in and sigh and thinks, "Shit, yeah. what's going to happen?" Um, I mean, Josh, what is the what are the odds of Arsenal getting uh, Calcedo one in this transfer window or in the next? Uh, this transfer window, I would say it's the same as everybody else, zero. Um, but in the summer, I think there's a real opportunity. Um, what I would say is that the um, posturing that, um, what's his face, that spends his life running around hotels in Milan, um, and then just says, Here we go. Um, Romano, oh, f- Romano, for Romano. Um, yeah. keeps banging on about how um, Caicedo's moved his agent. Um, mm. what I would mention for background, Caicedo's 19, um, and his agent beforehand was his mum. Um, what he's done is a 19 year old has gone, hang on, I'm a professional footballer. Um, I probably actually need representation above and beyond family members. You know what happens when you're looking for a big move and you've got a family member in charge of your contracts, you end up staying at Spurs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and your brother builds uh, an office, <laughs> has an office. Quiet. For his one client, <laughs> and he just sits in there, and I don't know what he does. Cries. Uh, yeah. Maybe he just turns around and thinks, looks at the, uh, looks at the cane shirt with ten spurs and a signature on it, and thinks, "Yeah, I'm doing all right for myself." <laughs> Again, it's not even your shirt, mate. It's like full Anton Ferdinand levels of uh, delusion. Um, 
actually that is one that if anybody does look up i think it's an interview with anton ferdinand and he's asked the question what his favorite bit of football memorabilia is and mm. um, bearing in mind he had an all right playing career his favorite mm. bit of memorabilia was a shirt his brother got him from the champions league final that level he, he actually did some good things it's great anyway um Oh, yeah, Caicedo. Um, no, it's, uh, people may have not realised how serious as well. I saw him in the gym two weeks ago, three weeks ago now. Um, mm. So I just told him Chelsea's shit, so he's not going there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, yeah, that's all I'd kind of said. Um, mm. It was kind of weird. I was thinking, who is that guy? I recognise him. <laughs> who the fuck wears a Venezuelan training kit? <laughs> to a gym and then clocked it must be one of the only three venezuelans that live in brighton in brighton yeah I was gonna say, <laughs> so there can't be many. Uh, <laughs> there can't be many in there and it wasn't estupian uh definitely not ceremiento so yeah um yeah, yeah as formerly knows as says it, he's probably off to chelsea now he's thinking i don't know who this ginger kid was he was sweating yeah. away trying yeah. to lift five kilo dumbbells uh <laughs> not listening to him <laughs> Um, the the one thing we'll yeah. say on the on the midfield thing mm. is if the stories about Declan Rice are true, mm. um, it's it's that weird thing of if they're that confident that they can get him that the stories mm. come out and it seems a bit weird that the stories come out but if they're really that confident that they can get him in the summer, it's what kind of midfielder can you actually get in now? Mm. and whether you can get someone on loan. Now, obviously, this season, you know, like Champions League, you can never say nailed on, but it basically it looks, I mean, uh, short of a uh, complete collapse of epic proportions, we're, we're in the Champions League next season, so the squad's going to have to be bigger anyway. You can't go into a league season with three centre mids when you play two all the time anyway. Um, so we would need four, five, you know, uh, maybe the fifth one is a Patino comes back from loan or whatever. If his loan continues to go the way it is, that kind of thing. Um, it'll be interesting to see who the midfielder is if we get one this window. I, I do agree with Carl that it's the one area that I feel nervous about. Um, I'm the the two guys who were there, like I would put them up against anyone at the moment. The way they're playing and the way the team's playing, I'd be like, yeah, any game, go into it. Yeah, you know, even the Man City game coming up, I'm like, yep, yeah, cool. I, I think they can do the job, but having the ability to rotate them at some points in the you know slightly easier games, and as you said, El Nenny is not a guy to complain, so that is a worry because I do think there are Premier League games where you could say, right, we'll bring El Nenny in for for Partey or for Xhaka or whatever, uh, and give one of those guys a rest. And if he's not available, I like Lakonga and I think he's got the ability, but like Carl, I agree, I think he needs. A season playing regularly mm. at this sort of either this level or you know not far off it with that physicality where he doesn't have the time on the ball that he did in the Belgian league. I feel like his biggest problem at the <clears> moment <throat> is also, and this isn't a slight on El Nenny, but is those two together don't create yeah. the speed of a midfield that yeah. we require. You could see and the it's, difference, it's, and you yeah, could, you could it's have switched. neither of those players' fault, no. But the two of them are are similar in their speed of play. If you if you take out one of Xhaka or Partey, it's mm. fine. But it's when you put in El Nenny and Lekonga together, it slows yeah. it down a little bit too much. I can't remember which game it was. Um, <clears throat> was it the Oxford? It was the FA Cup, yeah. yeah Oxford United, Oxford game, where they yeah. were both playing not very well. And Xhaka mm. came on and changed the game. You yeah. could have taken off El Nenny or Sambi and you'd have yeah. seen the same result. It was that yeah. requirement. We needed someone in that. Midfield you just one, yeah, yeah, one a slight different, yeah. Um, because I, I like both guys and uh, I like I love El Nenny, I think he's been a really good servant for the club. He's been here through really tough times, and I'm glad he's getting to see the good part of it. He's not the world's best midfielder, but he will go on the pitch and he will do everything you ask of him. Uh, he's not going to light up with amazing through balls or anything else, but when you need him, he'll get on the pitch and, and um. Yeah, it's a shame if he has got an injury and if he needs a you know surgery of some sort. So I'm hopeful that they get someone in in this window. 
Um, I think the only other transfer rumor is Chiesa is the new one that came out today, wasn't it? Uh, I saw yeah. um, <clears throat> for midfielders Weston McKenney. Oh, Weston McKenney as well from Juve. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, Who th- in terms of Juventus players, Weston McKenney is the much more likely one. Uh, thank you, Asa. <laughs> um, I just want to double check um, mm. on Weston McKenney, mm. if I remember rightly, in terms of his quality as a footballer. Um, am I right in thinking that if he could catch, he'd play NFL? Is he that kind yeah, of level of he's, footballer? He's not a bad. No, he's not a bad <laughs> footballer. He's not a bad footballer by any sense. No, he's he's a good player. Um, he's big. He's physical, but he's got the engine. He can run box to box and everything else. Um, Juve are just in a terrible mess at the moment um, mm. and it's tough for him to get as many games as he'd like and get a consistent run in the team I think if it was a loan um, I'd be quite happy with it if it was a signing I can't imagine it would cost a lot and I would think he'd be at least smart enough to know he's going to come in he's not going to be a first team starter mm. um, it's another American player which you know that connection again um, as for Chiesa I'd look, I'd love Chiesa. And and this is not a knock on Martinelli. I love Gabriel Martinelli. If we signed Chiesa, I would just, if I was a defender and Chiesa was in the Arsenal team and it was him one side and Saka the other, I would fake every injury possible because all <laughs> I'm going to do as a defender is get embarrassed all day long because that kid is absolute mustard. And he is so quick. And he's completely he's like Saka in the sense that he's fearless. He'll get the ball and he'll be like, no, I'm just running. I don't care if there's eight players between me and the goal. I'm going to go through every single one of them and just, and if I have to, I'll shoot from 30 yards and put it in the top corner. He's nuts. He'd just come back from an injury. I'd be very, very surprised if Juventus uh, let him go. If they did, I'd imagine it would cost quite a lot. Who knows what's going to happen with all the investigation stuff that's going on. Maybe that affects it. Um, Weston McKenney, Juve fans haven't really taken to him. Um, I don't think he's particularly happy at the club. If they could get some money for him, they probably would let him go. He's one of the few players they actually own and isn't <laughs> out on loan or on loan from another club for two years and all the weird deals they've done. Um, oh, I did get asked quite a bit on Twitter about the Kulazepski thing. As far as I'm aware, there shouldn't be any problem with Spurs signing. It's an obligation to buy him. There's the possibility now... And like, I know I say possibility, it's like very, very small percentages. I'm like one, two percent. So don't get your hopes up because I know a lot of people like Kulizewski. But there is a possibility that there might be some interesting things happen in terms of his contract. Whether it will be voided or not, I don't know. Or whether the obligation will be voided or not, I don't know. Because apparently one of the fees that was inflated was Kulizewski's. And obviously Patricia went from Juventus to Tottenham. And then Tottenham paid that money to Juventus for that player. So they're saying, oh, well, you did that on purpose so your old club can get the money. But it doesn't mean anything's going to happen with the deal. It's very, very slim. I don't think anything will happen with it because he's at a Premier League club and everything else, so they'll get away with it. But you never know. Um, I mean, yeah, West, Western McKenney could be one. If there was a fire sale at Juventus, John, mm-hmm. uh, barring um, Chiesa and mm. Dujan Vlaovic, what mm. other players would Arsenal be looking at? Or should be Arsenal looking at? I mean, I would look at Locatelli straight away and I would move a lot to try and get him. Whether you'd get him or not, I don't know. I know Chiesa is, you know, he, it's the whole leaving the Italian league thing and leaving Italy, whether you want to do that. Doesn't always work, generally doesn't. But if you can make it work, Locatelli is, it would be an amazing player. Would be so, so good for our midfield. Um, Isn't he still Chiesa a would, player? Or not? I thought he was I, still a SAS player. I think technically he's still a SAS player, but they always they have the obligation. So they do the weird thing in Syria that they started doing. And I think it might have been Juventus who started started doing it first, actually, of all of all the teams, uh, where they loan someone for like a year or two years and then buy them afterwards. And I think it's a way to spread payments and stuff and balance the books, which apparently doesn't work because you still get a 15 point deduction. <laughs> I have just checked. Um, he is still on loan. Yeah, uh, yeah, so, it's still yeah alone technically the the still season. alone, but uh, at the end of this window, they uh, at the end of this season, they they have to buy him for I can't remember what the agreed fee is. Um, but yeah, uh, Locatelli and Chiesa would be the two I would I wouldn't even think twice about. I'd be like, yep, there you go, there's the money, take them straight away. 
So, but um, whether it would happen, who knows? Yeah, that's uh, mm -hmm. but, um, just before we start listeners' questions, just want to mm -hmm. touch on the Man City game very, very quickly. Um, you know, it's a Friday night under the mm -hmm. lights. Um, just want to say, National Rail and hotels around Manchester, fuck you, because the <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, so I was gonna go. Uh, I saw Jeff Arsenal. I was speaking to him, and he get me tickets. And I was like, "Oh, do you know what? I'm gonna make a weekend of it. I'm gonna go." And I saw the prices of the trains and the prices of hotels in Manchester. I'm just like, "No way!" You're talking that weekend just for the game, hotels and train, four hundred pounds. And I'm just like, to, "To Manchester, like don't be so ridiculous. Like it's just silly." But Josh, um, Man City under the lights Friday night, um. Would you expect to see a much changed team um, from the Premier League team, or do you think we'll keep the base? Could you see people like maybe Trossard starting? Um, I don't think Kivio will probably start, but would you expect to see the likes of Vieira come in and maybe some others? Um, I think we'll see a mix, to be honest. Um, yeah, I think we'll see a mix of the first team and the second team. So things like Turner will come in. Um, but I'm not sure about what we see with the rest of the squad. Um, I've just seen Archangel's question as well. Uh, Vito Mamone off the top of my head. There's one. Um, Arsenal have had, I think, five Italian players. That's the first one I can think of. Lupoli as well. Um, who's the goalkeeper that didn't play any games for us? Oh. Uh, came on loan. Oh, Jesus. Um... Yeah. He was yeah. one. Yeah, I um, remember. There's a few more. There's not many though. Um, I think it's five. It's a good. It's a good pub quiz question. Um, anyway. I'll look them up now whilst you're answering Carl's question. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I think for the rotation of the squad, I think we do see a little bit. Uh, I mean, Eddie's probably going to start. Put it that way. Is there any option? Um, and then we would also have. Um, probably Vieira starts midfield it'll be one of Xhaka or Partey um unless I don't think we'll sign somebody tomorrow that would be able to get in in time um but yeah I'm Stranger expecting things have happened. it's true stranger things have happened but um I'm not anticipating that if we did sign someone they're coming straight into the side to play um Trossard comes in for Martinelli um it is interesting actually that um, I did mention it to us during the Man United game that um, Trossard came in so quickly. It's not like Arteta to make a substitution like that midway through a game. I thought that was very telling about his in-game management that he actually made some substitutions. I was expecting we were going to stay with that starting more or less the team that came out in the second half would play the entire 45 minutes. Um, but yes, um, as I say, I expect a bit of rotation, probably five or six names, not a full 11. Mm. Um, John, do you the, think that even if we sorry. didn't win this game, do you think it would mm. be detriment? I mean, you know, it's FA Cup, so it's a totally different kettle of fish. But mm. would you, if for some reason we didn't win this game, or even if we did win this game, would that be good for our sort of um, mentality? So if we did win it, we think, oh, you know, we can beat Man City, we can go into. Uh, yeah. a game against them or even if we did it we shouldn't let that affect our mentality to, to say oh do you know what Man City if we play them we're going to lose um, so they're going to come for us like they've got to chase us down mm -hmm. in the title race what do you think that would the outcome of that no I, I, I think I, I mean I think Arteta the, the way he's built the culture at the club now and the uh, mentality of the players is that they go into every game trying to win um, I think I mean, I can only see it as a positive for us winning. Um, you know, City side will be changed, but when City change their team, it's ridiculous to play. You know, it's like, oh, okay, we'll play Phil Foden and Mares, and, you know, Alvarez will come in for Haaland or whatever. It's still an absurd team that they're going to have on the pitch. Um, interestingly, I, I don't actually think the first level will be quite as changed. I could see Trossard starting and maybe Smith-Rowe, but I don't think there's going to be too many changes because we've got just over a week till our next game after Friday because we don't play Everton until the following Saturday. Um, 
the Saturday or the Sunday, I think. Um, so we do have a, a long rest in between. So there's no reason they can't put out a really strong team. Um, obviously, other than the players who who obviously need the minutes. Um, but yeah, no, I, th I think it's a positive. Uh, if you go and win that game, it gives the players more belief. It keeps the winning run going. Yes, it's extra games, um, but it gives them that confidence. And then when you get to City in the Premier League, you go, right, we've done this. It might be some different players on the pitch this time from when, when we played City before, but we've beaten them. We know how to do it. We go out there, we do the same thing. And and this time, you know, it would be, you know, it might be a, a better calibre of team we put out than than maybe in, in the FA Cup. So I think it's a positive. And I think weirdly, even if we did end up losing the game, I think the way this team has responded to defeats and things from, from last season that happened, um, like the Spurs loss, um, you know, the whole Brentford thing and Ivan Tony with a kickabout on the part, you know, nice kickabout with the lads and that sort of thing. Those sort of almost direct insults to the team from either an individual or a team or another player, you know, those kind of things. They've bounced back and really come back to make a statement about those things that where they've lost something or, or something bad has happened to the club in general. So um, I, I it's a uh, it's game, obviously, I want to win. Um, but weirdly, I think, regardless of the result, I think we'll get the benefit out of it either way, like in the long run. Um, so I think it is... Um, I, I hope we can win the game because I, I love the FA Cup. It'd be great to win again. Um, just quickly on the Italian football as we play for Arsenal, um, it was uh, Viviano was the goalkeeper you were thinking of, Josh. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, uh, but yeah, Manone, Viviano, Lupoli, uh, Pablo Marie is technically. Mm. I mean, he... is he? I mean, is he? So I mean... is, doesn't um, Martinelli I mean, have an Italian passport as well? Yeah, Martinelli. <laughs> Martinelli is a it is Italian as well, to be fair. Um, but yeah, Pablo Marie is technically Italian. Um, the other one is um, I'm not. Some people might remember. I do remember reading the story. Is uh, Nicolo Gali, uh, who was a young centre back, we had, and he died when he was 17. Uh, I'm just checking it now. He, we sent him out on loan to Bologna, um, and he had a moped accident. Um, yeah, so he was someone who they had very very high hopes for. Um, uh, he was a youth teammate of uh Cagliarella, who I'm sure anyone who's played FIFA or, or football manager or whatever is a player who everyone knows. And um, he wears the number 27, and that's one of the reasons why he uh, he uh, wears that number is uh, in honor of his teammate. And I think uh, foundation has been made in his honor as well for Nicola Gali, but he's never he didn't play an Arsenal game, he didn't get an appearance, but yeah. He was um, he was the other Italian player we had. So there you go. It's not um, many. No, not 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 many. But then not a lot of Italians do leave that league. So, mm. but with the food, the women, clothes, cars, weather, why would you leave? I I, I know I wouldn't. Um, I'd probably be chased out, but that's a different story. Should we do some questions? <laughs> yes, uh, John. Yes. I don't think even you're that sleazy. Mm, uh, well, <laughs> no, to get no, chased no. out of Italy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to be fair, Berlusconi lives there, so yeah, I'm not oh, as bad as him. Uh, right, okay, Archangel, this one's for you, Josh. Uh, how the F do Brighton keep finding these players? Well, um, come on, you've got a fun... short answer because we've gone on too long as usual yet again. <laughs> I feel like I need to give the full answer. The short, funny answer is that they've stopped getting players from Belgium and um, uh, Holland. Uh, that was the main issue. <laughs> Um, Yak and Bash, Lockadia, some expensive signings that didn't really turn out that well. But what actually what they do, um, and why it wasn't a massive issue with Dan Ashworth, Paul Win Stanley, Graham Potter taking his analytics guy as well, was that the scouting isn't done in house. They have an equivalent to Stats DNA or whatever Arsenal have got, but it's Tony Bloom, so the owner, his main business i think people know him as a poker player but he's also got a lot of um fish in sports gambling um that's where he makes a lot of his money and what he's got is basically an algorithm that helps you bet more efficiently more effectively uh, so they're collecting player stats 
to ascertain who's most likely to get X, Y, and Z if you're doing you know, the minutiae of shots on target. And anyway, you're collecting enough player data that one, you can help people gamble on it. And secondly, it's quite good for talent um, yeah, talent identification. Yeah. Um, so just to show the level of which Tony Bloom's um, system operates at, if you want to access his data for just betting, to get an understanding, not to get the raw data of saying, hey, go and sign this young Venezuelan kid from the Venezuelan league because he's 17, everybody wants him or nobody wants him yet. Um, and he'll turn out to be a worldie or another Argentinian who not even Boca Juniors or River Plate had really thought about. Um, but he's coming up whether the data sign him. He'll be assisting Lionel Messi in four years time to win a World Cup. Um, just to access the stuff to go bet on this guy, he might score a goal. Two million pounds is what you need to be staking in that. Wow. So we're talking high rollers, big business. Mm. Um, the guy knows what he's doing. There's serious clout behind this. And whilst he still owns Brighton, he will still let Brighton use that system. So yeah. it's why you can see with Chelsea's ID system that you're seeing at the moment, it's very much of what do they remember from the system? kind of things a bit yeah. like um when we got in the fraud from dortmund who um appeared yes. to only scout people who played at the um yeah. within a two mile radius of yeah. dortmund yeah um yeah you'll notice that chelsea will keep going back in for um brighton players mm -hmm. for a while but as soon as they're kind of given free reign and free will they won't be as effective um, the same for Newcastle as well. Newcastle are doing a good job, but their talent ID isn't at the same level. You can see the kind of players they're going after. Um, but if there's a club that can pay two million just to look at data, then <laughs> yeah, I mean, if there's, a, if there's a club, they will try and buy Tony Bloom. We'll put it that way. Yeah. They will buy him in some way or form. Um, but that's what. But that's basically how Brighton do their talent identification. Yeah. Is that they've got a very, very strong way of ascertaining and they yeah it's been mainly getting data from those middle leagues that no one's mm. really looking at the mm. kind of places where you hear about betting scandal kind of yeah. things it's always a it's never a bet on the premier league let's put it that mm. way when there's a big problem it's a bet oh in a, you can the ukrainian league used league. to be a beauty you could make a yeah. lot of money on that one again don't gamble kids it's really bad gamble, but... <laughs> <laughs> um carl one from phil macca um do you think Pep has been told not to sell anyone else to us or are they so rich that they don't give a fig? <laughs> no, I think he will maybe take a little breath before he does sell us. I mean, selling Zinchenko was, I think, the biggest, bigger mistake than selling Gabriel Jesus. I think Gabriel Jesus knew his time was up. Um, they brought in Haaland. They brought in their other striker. So Gabriel Jesus kind of knew that he wasn't flavour of the month and you know I think it's a time just a case of he needed to move on to further his career because I don't think Pep wanted him anymore and that's fine um I think with Zinchenko you know the fact that they already had a, a left back there so was he surplus to requirements as well because he wasn't playing that much either so mm. I think obviously Arteta saw something in him with his time at Man City so you know, to sell him at that price as well, 35 million, where a lot of people were probably thinking at that time, 35 million for a quote-unquote left-back, that's yeah. a lot of money. But the fact that it's kind of like what Granit Xhaka brings to the team. Granit Xhaka is a good footballer, but it's behind the scenes of what he does. The, the team yeah. talks that he must give, the, the the confidence he must give to players, That that's almost priceless. So um, I don't know if there's anyone else um, that... Man City want to get rid of. I mean, apart from maybe um, their hundred, their hundred million pound flop, who they're going, they're not going to make even half the amount of money back on him. Um, I mean, if they want to give us Phil Foden. I'll take him. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, <laughs> it, uh, you know, I'll take him. I like, if they want to give that one. I, I suspect yeah. that one. I, 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 no, I, if they want to yeah. give us Rodri, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll take him if they, they want to give him to us. Um, mm -hmm. If they want to give us this guy, I can't remember his name, ha ha Harland. Like, if, if they want, they want to give it to us. Like, we'll take him. Like, he may make our sub bench, but no, um, I just don't think that 
they saw I don't think Pep kind of saw Arsenal as a threat at the beginning mm. of the season and now he does yeah. I don't think he's going to be giving us players at least not for cheap mm. it's kind of like um, prime players going from sort of Chelsea to Arsenal or yeah. vice versa mm. like it's not going to happen for now it was the yeah, lesser I... of evils wasn't it to <clears throat> sell them to a top four contender is you don't want them going to Chelsea you don't want them going to Liverpool yeah so you probably get them to go to Arsenal. You at least know Arteta's gonna. <clears throat> it's gonna be the project that's gonna be sold to them as well. Yeah, um, there is there, there, yeah. them. Sec make a really good point in the chat that Pep has got a history of players who don't want to be at the club. He will say, mm. you know, let them go. Yeah. Um, especially if it's someone who's like they're not kicking up a fuss about it, but they're like, I would like to move on, and you know, they've done everything they've been asked whilst they're there. As long as and City, to be fair, for obviously, you know. We know we all know where the money comes from, and they have spent a lot, but they do have their limits. You know, they went to what 40 million for Kukurea, and mm. Brighton said, No, we want more money. They said, No, that's we're willing to pay 40 million, no more. And they said, Okay, you're not having him. And they went, All right, we're not going to sign him then. And Chelsea came in, obviously, with the bigger bid. So they, they are as much as obviously they've spent a lot of money depending on the player they do have their limits, and then they and they will take their this is the fee we expect for a player. If you meet that, then yeah, we will we will let him go. But obviously, if this trend continues, yeah, I think like I said, they're probably less likely to agree to to sell. Uh, I to mean, us. I think they kind of have to balance the books as well because you yeah. think they bought Grealish for a hundred mil, so they <clears> kind of <throat> needed mm. to offset that. I mean, you know, Grealish must be on minimum two fifty. So he's probably on silly money, yeah. God knows yeah. what Harlan's on. I know Harlan was only 62 million, mm. but you know, for the level of striker he is in this market, is, is very low. But I think you know. they need to do a midfield rebuild as well, which hasn't yeah. been spoken about. Mm. Um, so I, I do... feel like the selling at the moment was for them to fund next summer them going yeah. big on mm. replacing Gundogan and probably finding a long term solution to De Bruyne or Silver, yeah. Uh, so it wouldn't surprise me if we see a certain Jude Bellingham pop up at Man City uh, next mm-hmm. season. Um, right, one who we got more. Uh, Boy Ten Dio question: Are Arteta and Ten Hag the best tacticians in the league? Um, I would say Arteta is definitely up there. I, he's still got stuff to learn. I think his in-game management is getting better, like game by game. Uh, like Josh said, the, the halftime substitute, Ben White coming off and Tommy Essie coming on, that's not something he would have done at the start of when he first came into Arsenal. Um, the Trossard sub could maybe have been five five minutes earlier than it was, but it's definitely earlier than it would have been, again, at the, in his first season at the club. So he's got better. Uh, Ten Hag, I think, you know, he's, he's proved he's a good manager, what he did in the Eredivisie. He's obviously turned this Man United team around from what it was. Um, it didn't take a genius to know that getting Ronaldo out of the club would be the best thing for the club. <laughs> I still don't know why they signed him back. I laughed my ass off when they did, but everyone thought, oh, no, come on, he's the best goal scorer in Europe. And I was like, it's not going to work, but they wouldn't listen. <laughs> um, but I would actually throw another hat into the ring. Uh, Josh may not agree with me, but I would actually say that one of the best tacticians in the league is a new boy. And Josh is shaking his head already. Well, uh, no, uh... no, you've now changed to uh, new boy. I thought uh, you were going to mention the guy at Chelsea. Oh, no, 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 no. The no, guy no, no, no. that has come. He's talking about the guy, guy who has come in to replace him. Yes. He's at least 20 times the manager. And that's not bitterness. Yeah. It literally is. Every player is yeah. now talking about they thought that was the, the limit of the sky. Yeah. And this guy's come in and gone. Yeah. Sorry, mate. That was just a cloud. You yeah. were looking at low level fog. The sky yeah. is literally. Uh, Deserby is yeah. is a really really good manager. Um, he didn't when he first sort of broke in Syria. There was some question marks about him, and he didn't have the best time ever. And he moved around clubs and stuff. But he, um, yeah, for me, he's a very exciting manager. He wants to play good football. Um, he gets the most out of his players. Like he really really gets every single thing he can out of a player. Um, he's very Arteta in that way to me. Uh, sort of reminds me a lot of Arteta. It's, a, it's not they don't play the same way as Arsenal or anything, Brighton like that. But um, the energy and sort of the fluidity and stuff of the team uh, in that sense is very similar. I'd um, say Brighton are a bit more aggressive. Yeah, um, 
And that's, I think that's why he sort of stood out in Syria because of the way they would push forward against teams. And some of his teams, sometimes they might concede three goals in a game, but then mm. they'd be like, okay, we just need to score four. That's fine. <laughs> so, so it makes it also makes for quite exciting football. Um, so yeah, uh, how long he stays at Brighton, who knows? I hope for Josh's sake and for Brighton fans' sake, he stays there for quite a while because I think he's a really exciting manager and I enjoy watching Brighton. Um, but he is someone who it wouldn't surprise me if in a few years' times uh, some of the the sort you know big name clubs are sniffing around him again. Hang on a minute, we maybe need a little bit of a culture change here, and we want our team to play this exciting, expansive, you know, aggressive sort of fast-paced kind of football. Um, so yeah, I, I would put him up there because he really can change things within games, and he's really drilling down into the players, the tactics, and the way they play and everything. He's gone in two seasons. That's what I'm saying. He's gone to. A, he's going up in yeah. somewhere. Yeah, yeah. He will be either right now. He's the flavor of the month. Of if Arteta ever left Arsenal, oh, he would be like on my. He list. would be yeah. in yeah. On top of the on, list. He is the yeah. closest to Arteta. <clears throat> um, probably need to work on being a bit more defensively. Um, yeah, defensively stable. Sound. Yeah, yeah. But otherwise, yeah. Mm. Um, I would say. When you're what you're watching on TV is about sixty percent mm. of his tactics. Even yeah. when you go and watch what they're doing on TFO football, mm. they're probably covering eighty percent. There's still yeah. another twenty percent that you need to be in the stadium just to truly see. Yeah. Um, I mean, what he does for goal kicks is just it blows my mind. But yeah. I'll let people discover how he lines up a team for goal kicks. Yeah. Just to... um, but yeah, he, he's a very exciting manager for me. He's he's the one who, outside of Arteta, I um I really enjoy watching how he thinks about the game and if if you're into all that sort of analytical side of it, um, he's a good one to go look up and look up his time in Syria and what he's done there. Um, formerly knows uh, asked about any update on Fresneda. Not that we need another right back. Um, yeah, well, she's correct in the fact we have Ben White and Tommy Asu. I suspect if, we, like we said earlier, I suspect if we get Fresneda, then maybe Tommy Asu would become more of a centre back in our squad than he is a right back at the moment. Um, but he, the fact that he's that flexibility that you can play him anywhere across the back four, and it doesn't seem to matter what foot he uses. And he makes Marcus Rashford disappear, despite the fact he's in the form of his life. Um, hmm. I think that's just another plus to the squad. So, and if we do sign Fresnader, we wouldn't be seeing him until next season anyway. Uh, Demisek, do Spurs have to get Champions League to be able to keep Kulizewski? Right. I don't know if either of you two know anything about this, but from what I understand, and there's, I don't know if this is 100% true or whatever, because what's in a contract is very hard to see all the details. As far as I'm aware, he has to play 50% of the games and Spurs have to get Champions League. Then Spurs are obligated to buy him at a set price. If um, they don't get the Champions League or he doesn't play the 50% of the games, which I think he will hit that number regardless, I'm pretty sure. And I, again, this is not 100%. I don't know if this is true or not. It's only what's been reported in papers and in the Italian press and stuff. Then there isn't an obligation to buy. I don't see why Spurs wouldn't buy him. But to be fair, that club do have a habit of going, oh, this player's quite good and not keeping them and then buying shit ones. Um, <laughs> so who knows? But if if they don't make Champions League, maybe it does give room for other clubs to come in. It would be very funny if they missed the Champions League and then we got Kulizewski and they didn't. That would be <laughs> hilarious. Uh, because as you know, he is an Arsenal fan, as all the best players are. <laughs> Um, right, one more um, from Phil Macker. Uh, Josh, I guess you'd be the best one to ask this. Was anyone else in for Trossard? Do you know? Um, yes, Spurs. Uh, they oh. offered 12 million for him because I think somebody had wrongly informed them that he had six months left on his deal. Um, he didn't. He had 18 months left on his contract. Oh. Um, so what I would say to a lot of people looking at Brighton contracts is almost all Brighton players have a club option for an additional year um, and also as soon as you go in yeah yeah. as soon as you go in for him they'll just go oh we'll just trigger the extra year so it gives yeah. another yeah. Uh, whatever yeah, time for the, the salary yeah. bumps up the fee yeah. um, 
yeah, so it's the same with caicedo has got that. Uh, McAllister had it. I think he's got it again in his new contract, but his new contract isn't that long. If anybody wants to go and find a Jacker replacement or um, option for a Jacker replacement, <clears throat> um, Mr. Edu, that is your um, task for the summer, please. Um, I will do everything in my power to either um, help or not disrupt said plan. Um, mm. I will find McAllister and I will tell him <laughs> Chelsea's amazing or I really love Spurs just to make sure he goes to Arsenal. I was going to say, yeah, if you if you keep bumping into Caicedo and say, mm. just ask him, just say, do you talk to McAllister much? And then maybe he mm. goes to the training ground and says, mm. look, mate, whatever you do, don't go to this gym because there's this weird gym <laughs> guy. He keeps talking to me and he started asking questions about yeah. him. He said, you look a little bit like Aaron Ramsey as well. It's very strange. <laughs> um, well, no, I said that, but yeah. But yeah, drop that one in as well. Um, I think that is uh I think that is all the questions. Oh, actually, there was one more. Sorry, I did see quickly. Carl, uh, I'll give you this one. Um, it was also from Phil Mecca. Um, do you think Arteta wants to win something uh with us, or will he be happy to jump if a Spanish giant calls? Um, I think I don't see him going to Real Madrid, but mm. um maybe Barcelona if they come. Maybe, but with the messed up Barcelona are in as well. Would you want to go to that club? Because mm. they're in mm. financial mess as well. So that's going to be a whole nother thing for him to sort out. So at the moment, he's kind of got the running of Arsenal. He's got the backing of the club. He's got the backing of the owners. He's got the fans on his side. So, you know, even if Barcelona do come knocking or even Spain come knocking, would he go? I, I, at the moment, no. He, you know, he's got a process to fill out as well. So he wants to fulfil this process. And like you said, he had certain goals that he wanted to do, and he's like he said, he's ahead of where he wants mm. to be. So obviously, let him let him breathe. But you know, the fact that he's doing so well, it's always a, it's always a threat. Now, like any player that does well, any manager that does well, it's always a yeah. threat that someone else might come. Yeah. No. I agree, I mean, but yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think I can see him going anywhere for a long time. Yeah. No. A team in Sky Blue in Manchester would knock as much as they want, but I don't think he'd be tempted to go across there. Um, no. He's got too much allegiance. Yeah. Um, the only way I could see him going anywhere would be, I'm trying to think, he played for Barcelona, but I don't think he was a Barcelona fan growing up. I think he was a Sociedad fan. Mm. So there's not a huge, not as tight a tie to Barcelona I remember him saying that his idol was Pep growing up as a kid so that's what would tie him to Barca so maybe if Pep after decided he wanted to become president or something like that of Barcelona that's where I would see maybe PSG potentially but again if he thinks he could win the Champions League with Arsenal yeah why would you go to probably a club though where it's more difficult due to scale and level you have to go yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and expectation but like you've that, basically yeah. got to go from playing at a you know mid-table premier league level during the week to then going and playing against the top clubs mm. um that lack of um proper top quality opposition on a week in week out basis probably is what holds psg back from a uh proper champions league shout but yeah, and that club yeah. has no soul. It's only sixty years old, um, <laughs> which is a great note to just before we end the podcast is to wish uh, a certain pirate friend a very happy birthday. Um, so if you haven't done it, there is the beautiful man himself. <laughs> um, go and wish the pirate happy birthday on Twitter. Uh, it's on our it's on our Twitter account. Um, but everyone knows Chris's Twitter account. There he is, looking much better without the silly red hair. Um, I won't say how old he is. Um, there's a 14. four in it. <coughs> and a zero. So, yeah, okay, all right. Me and Carl both basically said it. But if you can work that out, he's apparently that old. Um, yeah, so go go wish him a happy birthday. He hasn't been very well lately, and he forgot it was his birthday until literally yesterday. <laughs> Otherwise, he would have been on tonight because he's an idiot. Uh, but, yeah, go, go give him all our best. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's about it for the podcast. 
Um, I assume, I don't know, I'm hoping Danny is reading my mind and going to tell me whether he's doing a preview show for the FA Cup game for the Man City thing. He's going to put that in the chat in a second. Um, if he is, then I will shout that out. But other than that, whilst I'm waiting for an answer, I'll just say, I don't know why I'm doing this bit because we haven't really had a host and Carl started the show. But I'll say thank you, Carl, for starting the show. <laughs> no worries, much appreciate you. Thank you very much. And sorry for getting you and Josh mixed up. You do look alike, obviously, like the yeah. hair just yeah, the, the hair's the same, the beard, the yeah. yeah, the way we decorate our homes is all the same. Josh and me, you know, always it's doing just the two white guys with beards, we get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Carl. It's fine. You can say it, Carl. It's all right. We, <laughs> we, we know we all look the same. Yeah. It's all right. Um, yes. Uh, so uh, on Friday, there will be um, a preview and a post game show with Stan and Deke. Um, so look forward to that one. Hopefully, it is a win. Um, Josh, thank you for being on. Um, thank you for your wise words about Brighton um, and yeah. all the information. Very, I did not know about the data thing. That's no. that is amazing. But yeah. Well, um, yeah, I'm glad I was appreciated on one podcast and wasn't cheated <laughs> off by another. <laughs> 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 right. Well, to be um, fair, you know, we're we're on yeah. with Carl, who's like a real radio star and everything now. So I mean, yeah, to be yeah. fair, if anybody heard um yeah. Carl on uh Talk Sport, it was mm. uh yeah. it was a beautiful thing and um yeah. yeah. Um he wasn't just talking about the strikes, um, I can no. assure you. Yeah. Was he was he was talking about football, not strikes. So yeah, it's okay. Yeah, uh, I think you got mean. Laura Woods' number, didn't you? After, I mean, I don't want to sort of put it out there, but if, if you go to Central London on Saturday, you may see us together again. <laughs> you know, I can't really talk too much about it. Right? So it's, respect our privacy, please. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, Carl is a gentleman and has beaten my record. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I've got no chance with Woodsy. Carl was on there chatting away. That was it. Yeah. She heard that well, voice. She was like, yep. It's... That's why his wrist is in a sling at the moment. <laughs> well, I think it's uh, for in the podcast, it's true. Once you go black, you never go back. And on that note, people, <laughs> take care. See you later. Bye bye. Splendid business.